Well, some of you know I went to Divinity School in my 40s. I'd waited a long time to go back to school, and when our youngest child started college, I told Fred it was my turn. So for three years, we commuted from D.C. to Texas, one of us flying every two to three weeks. It was a lot for both of us. And when I finished, we decided that a vacation was in order. Fred very kindly agreed to go to Costa Rica to a yoga resort. Yoga and Tai Chi had gotten me through graduate school, and I was ready to celebrate in a lush place where I could do yoga four times a day and have a daily massage. Fred only had one request. He wanted to include a whitewater rafting trip on one of those days. He had rafted down the Colorado the year before, and he was ready to see what Costa Rica had to offer. I should have said, have a good time. But instead, I said, sure, I'll go with you. So the Papaquai River, most of the time, is classed with rapids two to three. And with really great guides, it promised to be a lovely day on the water. These wonderful guides knew the river so well, and they put us through a fairly strict training session the morning of the trip. But the rainy season had begun early that year, and while it didn't really affect our yoga classes or our massages, it did make a big difference in the rafting trip. The rain was quite heavy for the two days prior to our trip, and on those days they didn't go out because the river simply wasn't safe. But the morning we were scheduled to go, it was declared good. Good. <laughs> I knew when I stood on the bank of that river that I should have said, nope, not going. But I didn't. And we got into one of the boats and off we went. It was a beautiful day, and I was loving it, even if the rabbits were actually pushing fours and fives. It was the ultimate high, until it wasn't. On the set of rapids called the coffins, <laughs> upper and lower coffins, keep in mind, we hit a rock, and I went flying out of the boat, just like that. I was a total novice. This was my first raft trip. And if I had not followed the instructions of our guides exactly, I would have never made it out of that river. After I surfaced for the first time, somehow above the roar of the river, I could hear the guides' voices in my head. They had told me to let the river take me down to not fight it, but to go with it until it spits you back out. They told me if I gave in to the instinct to fight back, I would die. Their training literally saved my life that day. When pain and suffering shows up in our lives, our inclination, first of all, is to fight it with all our might. No therapist worth their salt would tell you to let it take you all the way to the bottom. But sometimes life doesn't give us another option. Sometimes the choices we have made or the choices others have made for us bring us to a place where going to the bottom is the only available path. Conventional wisdom would tell us that we have to fight, and we have to look up and find the people that will pull us out. But what if that wisdom is wrong? What if the only ones who can help us are the ones who have been running those rapids for years and know what to do when the river overtakes us? The lesson from the Gospel of Luke reminds us that God is constantly turning conventional wisdom on its head. The Beatitudes that Nanika read for us are an invitation to look at our lives differently and perhaps to see as God sees. Within our cultural norms, we are taught from an early age to measure our own lives and the lives of others by the milestones of success. Milestones which may, in the life of God, be irrelevant to our worth. 
All of those conventional norms, though, are of little help to us when our child is diagnosed with a life-threatening illness, when our partner leaves us, or when we lose our business, our friends, and our net worth. We can't work harder or spend our way out of that much when life throws us the rapids. And yet, when our hearts are broken, sometimes we find that God is nearest. In the places where we feel struggle, shame, vulnerability, fear, and hurt, please understand that is not because suffering is redemptive, but because these are the times and the places we are more aware of and focused on our need for one another our need for love, our need for compassion and community. When our hearts are broken, we have to work harder to hide what is always true of us, that we cannot make it alone. Our awareness of our need for God, our delight in God, and our connection to others is palpable in these times. About the fifth or sixth time that river pulled me down, I remember thinking, this is so odd. I never thought I was going to die in a river in Costa Rica. It was also the time I remembered one of the other instructions that our guide had given us. Each time the river brings you back up, look for the one who's coming to help you. My new divinity degree wasn't going to get me out of that river. My privileged life was not going to save me. My reputation and all the good things I had done were of no help. I was totally in the hands of the young man in the kayak. Someone who didn't have my position and privilege, but someone who intimately knew the river and the rapids. Most of us live in the second half of the text we heard this morning. We are the woe to you crowd, rather than the blessed are you group. Most of the time, we are grateful for our positions of power and our relative wealth, and charity and generosity do come easily to us. But the story of God calls for more. That day when Jesus stood on the level ground with all the people who had gathered, he was paying attention to not only the individuals and their suffering, but to the power dynamics that were in play then as they are now. Who gets to make the decisions? Who has what they need? Who is welcomed and who is turned away? who is belittled, and who is uplifted. We are not all the same, and that has always been the case. And so God does not speak to us all the same either. We need to continually ask ourselves if we are content living only in the woe to you camp. And we may struggle with what the reversal of God might mean for us. I wonder, though, what it might be like if we choose that reversal rather than waiting for it to come. What if we chose to join the blessed, giving up our certainty and power by choice? What if we chose to not simply act out of charity, but instead to work as partners with those who are poor and hungry, with those who weep now and those who are hated and excluded and insulted? What if rather than looking down on them, we looked up to them because they were the ones who were coming to save us? The blessed ones of today know 
poverty and homelessness and sickness and hunger better than most of us will ever know. They run that river and those rapids day in and day out. They suffer at the hands of injustice, oppression, and normalized destructive systems. And they deserve our compassion and our companionship more than they need our charity. The Beatitudes remind us that God's response is always compassion, always support, and always of a reminder of what should and shouldn't and will one day be. Perhaps now is the time for all of us to get in the boat together. Even as we ask God to remind us that the blessed ones are the ones who know how to run that river and those rapids. And when we get in that boat together, we need to let them take the oars. It will be our salvation. May it be so. May it be so for us. Amen.